where we're not going to have any part of it. And I said, yeah. good, because you don't deserve any part of it. I yeah. wrote the fucking thing. Let's go. All right, we're live. <laughs> Man, welcome to Post 4. Welcome to another episode. Today we've got Alan Brown with us. He's a uh, retired career firefighter out of Newark, New Jersey, and Miami-Dade Fire Department. So we just kind of get into uh, different aspects of the firefighting and a little bit more of his background. All right, enjoy. All the all the all the uh, all the uh, mob people that I knew growing up, we treated with respect. They treated us with respect. They ran their their operations, their gambling, uh, their uh, construction trades, and, and and that kind of thing. And they obviously we were a port city. Newark is a large uh, shipping sh- shipping port, and they stole their percentage of what they needed to steal from there. But it was very rare, if ever, that I saw the, the, the associated violence and stuff leak over into the real people, into the citizens. They took care of them. They would deliver. We, we heated some of our buildings with coal. They would deliver tons of coal to the old ladies in the winter. Uh, nobody really noticed them. Was it, there just no police protection until the mob stepped in? There, there, there was police protection, which was historically corrupt. Uh, so... Our neighborhoods look to other things like the, the North Ward Citizens Committee in, in the north end of town run by Anthony Imperial, who knew who you know of. Uh, and uh, if we needed help, that's where we went. And what kind of help would, like example of help you need if just kind of anything, they're kind of like the social services for you? For, for, the, for the older people, yeah. But as far as uh, for me as a firefighter at the time in Newark, uh, one time we had a police strike, so there were no police and we were, we were under fire in one of the housing projects. And I got on the radio says, Hey, we need help. And, uh, the Northward citizens people were monitoring the radio. So they showed up with an ambulance and a, and a tank. <laughs> we were hiding under the truck and, 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 uh, they came and, uh, Imperial was a, a very imposing figure. What drew you to the fire service? Uh, my family, uh, as an example, my uncle and my, and my brother were both uh, EMTs with the local rescue company. And I always thought that that was cool. A, you got to stay out all night. You know, I was 15, so that was a lot of fun. And, and B, they always tell me these stories. So the day I turned 15, I, I went and signed up. And yeah. And what was that training like back then? N- non-existent. I remember you, you asked me to see if I could remember my first uh, run. And it was, it was May 8th, 1969. It was a sat, I think it was a Saturday. And again, with my brother and my uncle and we're on the ambulance, we, we go to a, a three alarm fire in a, in a, a tenement housing, a housing project, not a housing project, but uh, back then in Newark, there was a large, uh, uh, growth in, in construction after the Civil War. So 1870, 1880, a lot of these houses were built, four-story, wood frame, uh, railroad flats. So you'd have eight railroad flats in, in the building with balloon construction. You know what that is. So um, you'd have a central, a central stairway and a, a rear stairway that was open to the elements. So at the time, they uh, would heat the houses before they had central heating with kerosene stoves in each apartment. And the women would, would go down to the local uh, uh, grocery store or whatever to buy kerosene. They would carry the kerosene back and slop it up the stairs. So all these stairs in these 100-year-old buildings were saturated with hydrocarbons. So when you got a fire, it, the fire was immense and fast. So this was my, this was my first, first call. And I remember clearly pulling up and one of the firefighters who became a friend of mine later was doing, doing a a rescue on the top of a a banger ladder, a 55 foot ground ladder. And he came down and handed me two babies. Welcome, welcome to the fire service. No training. That was the first one. Volunteering, do you just kind of get hired as a career firefighter in Newark? Uh, it, it took a while. Uh, I, I did a summer on the beach as a lifeguard at, at Sandy Hook State Park. Uh, and then 
my friend asked me to take the, uh, he said, you should really get a civil service job, take the police and fire tests. And, and the old joke back then was uh, you, with, the, with the police department, you got a lot of responsibility, your oath of office and a gun and six bullets. With the fire department, you got a, a lot of responsibility, your oath of office and two sheets in a pillowcase. Who were some of like the, the most influential firefighters that you met throughout your career as well? The, you know, that guy that handed you the two babies or? Well, he, he later became my, one of my first captains. Since I, I started in 69 as, as an EMT, I got the job on the fire department in 74. And I walked into the station and he was there and, you know, we hit it off and he became a mentor because truly the, the guy had no, had no, uh, sense of danger. <laughs> so he, he taught me where to go, where not to go. You know, he, he was the kind of, uh, bon vivant, big imposing, uh, guy. He never wore self-contained, smoked cigars in the fires. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I worked with him on a tactical unit, which was, uh, we had bread trucks and all we had in the, in the unit were saws, axes, uh, and and hand carts full of uh, inch and a half hose. So we'd pull up on these amazingly immense fires and just go in and pull ceilings and put fire out. How long were you on Newark for? Eight years. Eight years. And then what drew you to Miami? Uh, volleyball. Volleyball. Okay. I was on I was on vacation, uh, and uh, I visited uh, one of the Miami stations at Hallover Beach, and here here are the guys at night with. Yachts going by, girls in bikinis and, and people playing volleyball. The guys were playing volleyball. I pulled in and I go, do you really get paid to do this? Night and day, especially from Newark. Was it the culture in Miami a lot different than Newark? It, it, was, it was a different culture in that Newark was primary, excuse me, primarily an interior, uh, interior uh, firefighting department. And we didn't have EMS. So when I got to Miami, they were integrating uh, EMS into the fire service. I got there right at the sort of probably 10 years into that. So In Miami, did you have to start on EMS first and then make your way to the fire, to a, a truck or anything? Or did, were you able to just get right on the line? Right on line. Right on line. All right. Yeah. Such a great career, I think. So much opportunity with it and so much you can see and do. And It really, it, 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 I, I was truly blessed to get the job, even though, I, you know, over the years worked really, really hard, but Miami was particularly good because it's a huge department. Now I think 3000, 4,000 firefighters, 78, I just looked at my calendar, 78 stations. We, we were, we had divers, we had air rescue. Uh, I worked on as a diver. I worked on the, on air rescue as a, as a air deployable diver. Um, I worked in the EMS division for a while. Um, you know, you could do, you could do 50 different jobs within the department. What was some of your uh, most memorable like diving calls? It was, it was interesting because uh, Miami Dade had a, a swimming requirement and I had just become a swimmer to become a, a lifeguard. So I figured before I moved to Miami, I better learn how to dive. And I learned how to dive in, in uh, uh, New York Harbor where you could, you could, you couldn't see anything. So, I get to Miami and go, wow, you can see stuff. Unfortunately, most of the dive calls we had were uh, in sewers. Oh, really? Okay. In in uh, canals and sewers. Uh, Did you ever get stationed at that? You said it was Hollington Beach? Hallover Beach, yeah. I got there a couple times, yeah. So like driving into like the first day of work, you know, your first day on the job, on the line, either Miami, Newark, or as a volunteer, if you could go back to tell yourself anything, what would it be? Like any advice for your younger self or, you know, anything that you wouldn't think of? Um, I, I, I think I would tell myself not to have expectations. It's, in my opinion, since 1969, the job hasn't changed. Fires are hot and, uh, you know, people are not nice. In, in Newark, they were, they were a lot, uh, it was a lot more urgent. In Miami, you have a lot of CBS construction, so... If you get stuck, you can back out. In Newark, if you backed out, the block burned down because of the nature of the you know the age of the of the construction. What were some of your like most memorable calls on Miami then? 
Uh, by, 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 by far the most memorable call is the value jet crash in 1996. Um, it was a, a, a DC-9 that uh, a fire started in the overhead compartments in, in the uh, oxygen generators. And uh, it quickly it quickly spread throughout the cabin and right over the airport, the uh, plane spiraled and crashed into the Everglades. So we sent our air rescue unit out first and they couldn't find the plane. What do you mean? It's a, it's a DC-9. Where did it go? Couldn't find it. No wreckage, no nothing. We got there probably 30 minutes into it. We couldn't find the plane. And it, it was slowly evolving that maybe a life preserver popped up and the plane had get gotten trapped in uh, four feet of water under muck between the, the limestone bedrock and, and a few feet of muck. The whole plane was gone. We saw nothing in four feet of water. And then the slowly the recovery came out and it was the hardest effort we, I think we put forth, um, alligators, snakes. Stuff you guys did to keep everything back like that with all the, the other elements on you? Well, we, we, uh, we qu- quickly realized everybody was deceased. So it became a recovery, uh, but it was a month long recovery. So we had a lot of time to put the organization and the incident command structure in place to, to handle it. How did you handle that? Like when you got back to the station? Well, I never got back to the station because uh, from the scene, I got dispatched to the airport to take over the family reunion area because I was a, a psychotherapist. I was, a, you know, a licensed guy. So they sent me there to, to do a dual role of providing medical care and uh, uh, can't counseling the families. Very surreal moment, I'm sure, just to be able to like be in that position as a firefighter responding to the call. Then all of a sudden being at the airport, meeting the families of the victim. The saddest, I think the saddest thing about that position was the fact that, uh, I, again, you know, I, I say 95% of the people I met there weren't nice and the families really were fragile and the weirdest, evilest people showed up, lawyers and fake psychologists and it, it was an incredibly surreal scene for me. Especially the lawyers. And what were the fake psychologists? Were they just trying to, or were they kind of like the, the ambulance chasing lawyers and stuff? The, the lawyers were trying to sign, sign them up. And uh, the, the fake people were just trying to, to be important, to be on TV. And, and then, then the, at the other end, at the crash site, um, people were showing up in airboats to uh, pillage. I've been to one major helicopter crash back in Newark and then two, two jet crashes, two major jet crashes in Miami. How did you come about getting your master's in clinical psychology? I didn't want to load trucks. I was driving down the street one day and I said, God, I don't want to load trucks, but I need another job. Cause at the time, you know, back then we weren't well paid at all. Did you mainly just see people on EMS in the fire and police? No, I worked, I worked in community mental health and saw, um, uh, I, I specialize in a dual diagnosis uh, population of substance abuse and major mental uh, disorders. So I saw some really uh, amazingly disturbed people. How much of the drug war did you guys see like on a daily basis from like the fire station was? We, we were targets to, to a point. They sort of knew they, need, they, they needed us, but uh, in the areas, uh, Again, you learn the you learn the rules in Newark. Uh, it was a lot easier to learn the rules in Miami. Not so easy to where you could go, where you couldn't go. Uh, you know, no guy. I don't care. You have this cocaine. Throw it out. I'm not going to say anything. For instance, when I when I uh, um, there's a, a fire station that's near. Uh, I don't know what it's called now. It used to be Joe Robbie Stadium, the Dolphin Stadium. Um, and my first day going there, I passed a, a gas station, and I pulled I pulled in to get uh, fuel up. And there was a guy uh, dealing. So, uh, you know, hello, how you doing? Talk to him. And over the years, I'd see him on the same corner doing the same thing. And as I was leaving Miami in, uh, when, when did I quit? 206. Uh, I'm going up the road and he's there with his kids. 
and they're still doing the same thing. <laughs> hey, you know, goodbye. <laughs> I, w- I wave to them. And <laughs> so, yeah, see you, see you never again. <laughs> yeah. w- with what you see today kind of going on in the world, the more homelessness, more mental health issues in the community, do you have any, like, what kind of suggestions would you offer to make things better? I mean, things will never obviously get better, but... I think it's easy to make things better, or at least a little better. You have to provide uh, structure and mean it. You have to put parents back in the home. That's, that's when it all fell apart, when AFD, AFDC and the, the Great Society, that's when it fell apart. If, if you fix the families, you're going to fix the problem. Mm-hmm. And with the, with the problems, we have a, a tremendous uh, homeless problem in, in Bellingham right now. Um, back when I was studying, way back when I did my first master's in New York, uh, I read a book by, I think I, I, I'm going to quote the guy, Harry Stack Sullivan, where before, before there was a lot of rules, he took, uh, I might be wrong on that guy's name, but he, he took a schizophrenic population and took them to an island off the coast of Maine and let them go and came back a month later. They're still there. They're building their little homes and they're, they're having a little society going on. And once the environmental press was such that it was, it was real and it was strict and it was heavy and consistent, they survived. People are very uh, adaptable too, even with like mental health. I mean, cause there's always a function of the mental health. There's always a reason why, right? Yeah. Or- when I did, when I did my uh, master's thesis, I, I actually did it on a firefighter population. I found 14%, 14% of the population I studied, my sample had access one uh, mental health disorders, major mental health disorders, but they were medicated. They had support. They, they uh, had structure and they functioned as firefighters for their entire career. Access one, would that be like bipolar? Is that borderline schizophrenia? What about for like the community? Um, I think there's a bigger, bigger thing right now on like mental health in the community. It seems like there's always just a bunch of money pumped into all these nonprofits that really don't do anything. That's a, that's a really good observation. Um, we have, we have a, a, a lot of money going into those programs and Trust me, I can go out and find psychologists. They'll say, well, I'll fix all your problems. Give me the money. But I think they have an inflated self-worth. Uh, and I, I know from what I read, I can't fix everybody. And there are certain people I, I can't even attempt to fix. But you give me enough money, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll certainly try. You know. Advice would you give probationary firefighters going into their first day or their first year? Be humble. Clean, clean the bathrooms. Be humble. Don't take a nap. You do that, you're good. <laughs> you kind of really have to earn your spot. And I don't feel like that's done enough in other careers. I think even even the fire service now, it's less popular because we're, we're being forced to be PC. Uh, if I, re- I remember as a, as a firefighter in Newark, I mean, they would haze you, but it was great hazing. You would, you would if you weren't the first one down the hole, the pole hole, I mean, you, you, you got left. Yeah, you never never be the last again. <laughs> never be the last again. But they would they would uh, they would fill the hatch of the pole hole with cigarette butts. So when, when you hit the pole, you'd be covered in ash when you hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Was there uh, some pretty other good hazing? Uh, we wrapped a guy up in in cling bandage and put him in the refrigerator in the morgue. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> Just for fun. What? advice do you have for people leaving the fire department, leaving the fire service, transitioning it out? Because the fire station is a lot different than any other place you'll ever be, really. That's for sure. Yeah. Two things. Um, be smart enough day one, before you think about leaving, is to find a financial planner to, to teach you about money. Because so many of the guys, uh, when we did start to make money, here's the Corvette. Well, no, you know, you need a 401k, not a Corvette. And then when they, when they retired, they didn't have much or they didn't, you know, weren't planning ahead. The, I think the second thing is to realize it's a brotherhood. It is, but it's also a job, J-O-B, and it's just a job. 
So you need to, uh, you know, I always had interests, hobbies, uh, goals, look to my family for support. And I have friends that their identities were so tied up in being firefighters that when they left, what did they do? Show up at reunions, drink a lot. Uh, they had no life and they commit suicide. The suicide rate of the people, you've got this wonderful life ahead of you and you choose to commit suicide because your identity was welded to the fire service. Well, I was lucky. I was lucky in that I had, a, I had an officer starting out uh, who was a, a, a financial planner, lucky me. Um, and everybody in the station, he wouldn't, he would, he would wake you up at night. Hey, come sign these papers. And he, here's your plan. Here's the day you're going to retire. And here's how much money you'll have when you go. And he kept hounding us with that. And I listened. Yeah, that's a huge point. The second thing is having hobbies, jobs. As, as a retiree, I'm too busy. I, I want a day off. Like, leave me alone yeah. for a day. <laughs> And then that kind of goes into just how adaptable firefighters are. And it's kind of hard to put that down on paper too, when you're applying for jobs or careers after the fire department, how to sell yourself or how to, what, you know, people can do to kind of even boost their confidence after they get out. I think mm -hmm. it's a huge. Well, I think, I think uh, you've had, you have so many wonderful role models in, in the fire service. You, you need to attach yourself to a few of them and say, well, Hey, how'd you do that? Like, uh, I remember, do you know what the SARA Act was the, the, when they first started testing hazardous materials uh, back, in the, back in the 80s? They, they had a thing where uh, you needed to do uh, gas station tank inspections. And a friend of mine says, hey, let's go do this. I said, no, I'm in graduate school, so I can't do that with you, but I'll, I'll look and I'll help you do it. And he set up a business from the fire station where he would go out and inspect gas stations. He, he sold it a few years later for $6 million. Attorneys, we have doctors. Uh, so it was, it, the, the best thing for the young people to do is not get caught up in spending the money and having, you know, you know, your, your chick magnet as a firefighter. You know? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To, to find those uh, role models. Do you still practice psychology at all? No, I play. <laughs> I had I had some uh, uh, bucket list things when I retired. I wanted to become bilingual, which I am now. Uh, and uh, I wanted to learn to, your aunt insisted that I learn to play tennis and now we play tennis, so. Oh, very cool, yeah. <laughs> what uh, language did you learn? French. French, okay. Yeah. I remember you were taking like a French history class too, last time I saw you, right? Yeah, I study, uh, my, my thing is uh, French and American relations, like uh, Ben Franklin writing the U.S. Constitution in a cafe in Paris. And I study uh, the history, the interaction between U.S. and, and, and France since, say, 1879, uh, the wars. Uh, First World War, Second World War are my, I, I think, my favorite topics. Well, I, I was lucky in that when I, when I moved to Bellingham, I met a group uh, of veterans. And I, I've always been, I, I was never in the military, but I always was because of my dad. My dad was a, 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 a veteran. I did outreach to the veteran community in Newark. And for, we used to take care of World War I veterans back then. And I had a, a great friend who was uh, a double amputee from uh, the trenches under Jack, Black Jack Pershing in, in World War I. And I heard his stories and I, would, I never, never, never uh, ceased to be amazed by the uh, courage that we don't have today. You know, uh, and then when, it, when I moved to Bellingham, I tied up with this group and we used to go to breakfast. The group has been consistently going to breakfast except for pandemic since 60 years, the last 60 years. They were um, people from the Normandy invasion. A uh, good friend of mine who re died a few years ago was one of the, he was at the Normandy invasion. He was one, you know what a minute man or the monument men. Uh, no, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a good movie, with George Clooney 
Okay, yeah, with the art, right? And the art. He was one of the yeah. art guys. Oh, really? Yeah, very cool. But I, I got to hear their stories, and I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by their, their courage. I met uh, Audie Murphy when I was a kid, because my, my dad served with uh, Jack Dempsey, the boxer, Cesar Romero, the actor, uh, and they were in, on a, uh, in the Coast Guard, but they got nationalized at the time. So they were in the, in the Navy, under the Navy. And uh, afterward, Jack Dempsey had a, a restaurant in New York. So my dad would always drag me there. And I'm a little kid and looking up. And Jack Dempsey would pick me up and bounce me around. And, and uh, I got to meet Audie Murphy. And totally unassuming. Uh, and the hero just like leaked out of them when you, when you met them. There's a, there's a fun, uh, fun anecdote, which I'm not sure is true about uh, Jack Dempsey. They were, they were training at Manhattan Beach in, in Brooklyn during, before, during the war. And it was not unheard of for, for German submarines to make landings at Manhattan Beach and go in for dinner. Really? <laughs> during the war. You know? <laughs> so the, the, it, it, it's an anecdote, so I'm not swearing to it. But apparently Jack Dempsey and his crew were walking down the beach and they wouldn't give them bullets. I guess back then they were carting uh, M1s or something uh, with bayonets. And here comes the, the German commander with their little inflatable. And here comes the, the Coast Guard. And they, they confront this uh, German, German crew. And the German commander says, hey, we're just going into dinner. We're not blowing anything up. <laughs> and yeah. supposedly Jack Dempsey says, well, uh, no, we're not going to let you do that. And the, the German goes, well, we, we know you don't have any bullets. And Jack Dempsey takes his bayonet and chops the guy's ear off and says, we don't need bullets. What are some like the hardest lessons you had to learn from the fire service? Two and- bad calls and uh, uh, one good call. The first bad call was uh, the experience of getting through Hurricane Andrew in 1992. I was uh, given the assignment of running a, a Red Cross shelter um, designed, it was in a high school in, in North Miami. It was designed for 1,500 uh, refugees. We had 3,500. And uh, it, w- it was truly a, a, a scene from uh, like Night of the Living Dead. It was so surreal and, and profound for me. Um, after, the, after the night, we were locked down. And luckily, we had some German firefighters vis- visiting on vacation who saved ma- my bacon for sure. Um, we opened the doors and went outside and there was nothing. We saw nothing. A hundred, we had two, 200,000 buildings damaged and a hundred thousand buildings totally destroyed. And that still affects me today, but it, it taught me about, uh, how do you eat, you know, the story about how you eat the elephant, you eat it one bite at a time. You open the door, you see all that damage, you go, where do we start? Well, we start here. We start and we bite the next bite of elephant. I still, I still am affected by it 30 years later. Yeah. In which ways? Uh, when the wind blows and when it rains. Really? Every time. The, the, sec- the second thing I think that affected us most of, obviously, was 911. Because in, in, my, in my dual positions as a Newark firefighter, and as a um, Miami firefighter in Newark, I, I, I got my, my fire science degree from Jersey City uh, State College, which was uh, directly across the river from the towers. So we got to train on the towers. We got to inspect the towers. We got to inspect the tunnels. Like the back of my hand, I know that the Hudson River tunnels. And when, when that happened, Number one, I, I didn't believe the building could collapse like that. Now that I look at it in the construction, I, I know it could. Uh, but it, it, it affected us in, in Miami in that I worked a mile from the flight school where the pilots of the crash, uh, the crash planes trained. And 
I, I just, I, I, it was, it still is hard to realize that there's, that was the first time in my life that I realized that evil existed on such a grand scale. We were, there's a, 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 a funny thing, not a funny thing. Uh, when we, we used to do the inspections of the towers, there was, uh, when they first designed these tunnels back in 1870, they built, they tried to build them out of brick. Not a good idea, <laughs> but they used, pressurized air through caissons to keep to keep the river from collapsing over you know but they did have a, a tunnel collapse with uh, 21 21 uh, they called them sand hogs were buried in the tunnel and they're still there so we used to go down and we'd see the caisson and there's a little plaque and uh i was i was just shocked that the, that could happen and Still, that bothers me, you know, knowing that that's a possibility. And it's, it seems like it's more of a possibility every day now. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no really. kidding. I mean, so. internationally, too. I mean, especially with all that going on overseas and Afghanistan back open now, it's just, I don't know. Hopefully, uh, Americans are a little bit smarter this time. We're not. You know, I, I, I hesitate to tell this, but uh, a week after a week after the buildings went down, we were outside one of our stations. We're smoking cigars. We love to smoke cigars. And a, a lady pulls up in front of the station and throws a bag at us. You know, we're thinking, oh, no, what is she throwing? It, it was the flight manuals for the bombers. And she just threw them at us and took off. Yeah. And nobody cared. We, we had the flight manuals. It took it took almost a month for whoever came to come get them. Really? And they had all their names on them? And... Yeah. So I don't think we're smarter. No. <laughs> I just think, yeah, I think more, it seems like Americans get more ignorant or more naive as the years go on instead of more intelligent, I guess, or more mature. Well, we're fat. Yeah. We're fat. There's yeah, different priorities now for mm -hmm. Americans in general. And it's just, this is not a direction I like to see everything headed, but I don't no. know. I was glad I got out of Seattle before then. I, have you been since? We we don't go, but yeah, our town is becoming that. You know, you, you look at you look at certain things that the government does to add to the problem. Like um, you mentioned when it when I was in Newark, the number one thing that created created our major fire problem in Newark after the riots was the uh, it's called the fair access to insurance requirements. It was. Uh, if you ever want to read a really good book about fire history, it's called America Burning. It's a report on the national uh, uh, fire problem in America. It's, you know, uh, but it's called America Burning. And they talked about this fair access to insurance requirements. They passed the law. All of a sudden, these uh, inner city neighborhoods who did need, did need uh, attention were instantly... Uh, uh, able to get fire insurance. So the routine was you call up and say, hey, I just bought 902 Bergen Street and I need insurance. Okay, I want a I wanna $100,000 insurance. Now on a, on a derelict building that's worth about $2,000. The inspectors were so far behind coming out and saying, yes, you can have that that they would throw binders at these people and they'd instantly have fire insurance up the next day, the, the building burns down. So we had landlords, one landlord in particular that burned 93 buildings and killed 20 some people. So it got to the point where in the, in this summer, we'd be sitting outside the station and, uh, you know, our hobby was to shoot rats, you know, we'd shoot the rats, uh, but we'd see people going down the street with mattresses on, on the roof of their cars. So we'd stop them and say, hey, where do you live? Because they knew that the building was going to burn that night. And we'd go and, you know, hopefully pre-fire plan the building, knowing it was going to burn that night. Especially, yeah, older, older cities with all the older buildings. And, yeah, that, I don't know. That's a... But that's the same thing at, uh, you know... It's happening now where we're uh, having government intervention that creates crime problems. Yeah. So. Government non-intervention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Well, here, here they recently changed the requirements for, probable co- for defining probable cause. So you, you, couldn't, you can't stop somebody based on reasonable suspicion, meaning, hey, you don't belong in this neighborhood. Let me check you out. Now they have to have the strict requirements of probable cause. So basically, uh, people show what we had in, in our neighborhood, uh, car prowls and, and break-ins, guys sitting outside the house. We know what he's doing. I mean, we're not stupid. Police come up and they said, well, we can't talk to him because we don't have probable cause. And the crime problem in town has skyrocketed because of this one law that was passed. And the people that want those laws changed, I don't think it affects them for a couple of years, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Like the people that want all these big sweeping reforms, it's like they, they're so far away from all the problems that it's not even... I know. They don't even see it. They don't even believe it, which is even worse. And what was uh, one of the good calls that... As a, as a paramedic, I had a, 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 a magic medical director. His name is uh, Dr. Donald Rosenberg at the University of Miami. He's, he's a saint. His, uh, as, as a character, his, uh, his, he came from a, a New York family uh, of vaudevillians. So he had a great comic sense. His family owned a, a supper club and they, they would do vaudeville. So he always used to get in trouble by not being PC. But he was, he was a brilliant, a brilliant uh, cardiologist. And uh, he taught us this approach. And this is a good thing to teach probationary people. Uh, everybody is sick until you prove they're not. Your goal is to prove them sick as opposed to prove them not. You get a call at at three o'clock in the morning, you're pissed off, you don't want to go. And and the lady says, I'm I'm nervous. Oh, you really call this? You start to get the attitude. You really call this at three o'clock in the morning because you're nervous. Didn't you have anything better to do? He taught us that that lady's having a heart attack until we prove that she's not. And the, the, the positive approach, the positive forward approach saved many people and in, in particular one lady who became friends with me she uh, we were at the at the grocery store getting lunch and the crew was about to to blow her off and say go home she said, i'm a little ner- nauseous and and I, I go to the crew wait a minute because i was a supervisor i wasn't on the unit i said wait a minute go prove her sick go find something wrong with her what do you mean you're going to make us do an ekg on her yeah yeah i am and they go, hey, Cap, look, MI, she's having an MI. Oh, she was just nervous. You know, it, that really changed my life by having this guy teach me how to look at people. There is an underlying reason at 4 a.m. why they call. Exactly. And it hasn't changed. Another lesson for the proby is, you know, when I started in 69, of the calls were BS. Mm -hmm. When I left in 206, 90% of the calls were BS. So the job never changed. So if you think it's going to change, then you're going to get frustrated. You're going to not do a good job. If you think this is the job and I like it, then you survive and thrive. Or what have you learned about like just fitting in with new groups all the time? Because of the fire department, you're swinging constantly. You're meeting new people all the time. You're... How do you find yourself being able to fit in so well with other groups of people? Hmm. Uh, here I do, uh, I, I do competitive shooting. Uh, we play tennis. Uh, I'm uh, the leader now of a, a group of preppers. Mm-hmm. And they're county people. They're very different people than me. And I go there, every time I go there, I said, what can you teach me? And... I, I never try to teach them. I always say, well, what can you teach me? It's your turn, you know? And by fitting in, very, uh, trust me, it's a very different group than me. Uh, they're cool. I, I, I learned how to gut a rabbit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What about for people that find themselves like too, too confident or not humble enough as probationary firefighters, how do they dial it back a little bit? Or is it kind of just something they got to learn? Clean a lot of toilets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about like people 
in the station and stuff like that. If they're moving from group to group, they're moving from crew to crew. They're not really liking it. We, we were lucky in that we had a lot of uh, uh, lateral mobility. So if you really were someplace you didn't like, you could go someplace else. You, you could get a different job. You could do, we had a, we have a, 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 a snake unit. Oh, really? You like snakes? You go play with the snakes. I didn't, I didn't like them, but you know. They respond to every snake call? Well, after, after Hurricane Andrews, life changed in, in so many ways. Uh, people that had pets let their pets go. So we had tigers and lions and giraffes and every kind of snake you'd want. And, uh, the pets got loose. And South Florida turned out to be the best place in the world for them, you know. So we had to learn quickly about really bad venomous snakes. And Terrifying to have to deal with that. Well, now, now South Florida is infested with uh, Burmese pythons. 200-pound snakes. <laughs> From Anaconda almost. <laughs> yeah. So we did that, and we, we wound up... Uh, we wound up uh, being the storehouse. If you're if you're in the Middle East now and you uh, get bit by a snake, you might get the venom from South Florida from our, our department, anti venom. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about this, especially with your background in psychology. What kind of observations have you had about, I guess, people in general through the fire service? Because when you're going to call, you're kind of seeing behind the scenes of what the you know real life is. You kind of see behind the veil of everything. You kind of see people at their most vulnerable states, you kind of see people who they really are behind all the facades when there's something going on in their life. I think I said in the beginning that, uh, you know, 90% of the people I met weren't nice. Mm -hmm. And luckily the fire service had most of the people were nice, but people a lot of the times aren't honest. People a lot of the times don't have integrity. Uh, And I was lucky to work with 2000 guys who for the most part, had their crap together. And it, it, it's for me, I mean, I, I, a lot of people would say I have a, a negative attitude, but uh, for me, it was, I didn't realize there were so many bad people out there. I, I, I am lucky. I, I, I am blessed. I got a beautiful wife, as you know, I got a nice life. Uh, <laughs> and I did it right. And if you find people like me or, you know, whoever to follow, you can do it too. Anybody could be good. Anybody could work the system and do it well. Um, I'm lucky that I survived. You know, because obviously, you know, the hazards that we put ourselves through, the toxic chemicals, the danger. You know, I had partners shot. uh We made it through and uh, I'm, I'm blessed in, in that respect, but anybody could do that. And there are no shortcuts. No. Well, it's a, sort of like a, my example when I, when I decided to become bilingual, uh, you see all these ads where you can learn to speak French in 90 days or, you know, three weeks later, you can speak French. Well, no, you can't. You know, who is the author that said, whatever you do to learn it to do well, you do, need to spend 10,000 hours. Do you have any other books in, that you'd suggest for anybody? Well, for fire service, I think America Burning gives you a really good uh, background. And if you're curious about that whole uh, Sopranos thing, there's a book called To Drop a Dime by Paul Hoffman, published in 76. And it gives you uh, uh, a good background into the, the uh, mob's uh, infestation, you know, they fought, even even in when we were in Miami, the the mob is all over the place. Yeah, the, the Genovese family followed us down there. You know, they're they're everywhere. I watched The Sopranos with a ship with a. Well, we were all watching. Did the mob ever get into like the fire service with either like in, like racketeering or anything like that? Or they they got into I think, and this this would be I'm guessing uh, inspections. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, the inspections are just kind of getting stuff through quick and like what happened in Miami with the building collapse, the condo collapse. Uh, I, I, I was intimately familiar with the building that collapsed. And in that type of building, because we that was the area of that hall over where they were playing the volleyball, um, we knew that things weren't right. 
you know, a lot of the buildings are, are built on packed sand foundations. Hmm. We, we knew, we saw uh, leaks, we saw cracks. Uh, we knew it was only a matter of time. And that was coupled, not so much, not so much with organized crime, I don't think, but with the influx of the, the, the drug money, the, the, the building, the building uh, industry took off. There was just so much money and so, you know, much money to spread around. There's a big drug, a uh, drug lord that lived there or something like that, or he built it or something like that. It was. That's where the money came from. They, they talked a lot about the funneling of drug money into building up Miami to what it became eventually. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Did you, uh, was there a point in time where like the drug war got just better in Miami at all? No. No, it just, just continually worse. Yeah. What, what happened was the drug war shifted. It shifted from the, the uh, South Beach Maserati uh, lifestyle to fentanyl and heroin in, in, in the poor communities that were, really was a scourge that nobody, nobody had a, a real desire to stop. Like I said, the, uh, I, I waved to the drug dealer coming into Miami. I waved to his family leaving Miami. If you enjoyed the episode, click the subscribe button and uh, come back for more content.